I'm Farhan Dalla, Transformational Trainer, and welcome to Elevate Your Life, a transformational podcast, an invitation to take the journey towards your deepest self. It is my intention to inspire you to connect, move, and meditate. We'll tap in, tune in, and dive in, and together learn and reflect from authentic, real, and transformative conversations. Let's get started. Today, I have a fascinating guest and an amazing human being, Dr. Amy Novotny, who I've gotten to know recently. I was initially introduced to her on her work um, on the Mindfulness and Grief podcast, and I knew right away I needed to connect with her. And when I read you her bio, you'll understand why. Dr. Amy Novotny founded the Pabar Institute with the mission to provide pain, stress, and anxiety relief to those who seek a naturalistic form of treatment when other treatment methods have fallen short. PABAR stands for Pain Awareness Breathing Release. Her unique approach comes from her experience treating in a variety of settings and with a wide range of patient populations over the past 12 years. Her background in orthopedics, sports, geriatrics, balance disorders, nerve injuries, and most recently chronic pain, and influences from coursework at the Postural Restoration Institute gave her the foundation to develop this treatment method to address a wide variety of painful and restrictive conditions. Her methods have helped countless people reduce and eliminate pain, stress, anxiety, orthopedic surgeries, sleep issues, and the need for medications. She co-authored two Amazon number one best-selling books, Don't Quit, Stories of Persistence, Courage, and Faith, and Success Habits of Super Achievers, which share her journey on how and why she developed the Pabar Method. Her ability to speak French and Spanish has allowed her to communicate and help various clients from all over the world, including France, Mexico, Central America, and South America. She has a variety of interests, including 40 plus marathons, running 10 ultra marathons, including two 100 milers. I'm gonna read that again, including two 100 milers, completing an Ironman triathlon, but I do wanna say maybe Iron Woman triathlon, photographing wildlife and landscapes all over the world that has led to several of her images being chosen as photos of the day, most notably National Geographic your shot world top photo of the day. Visit her photography portfolio at amysimpressions.com and to learn more about the Pabar method at pabarinstitute.com. And I will share her contact information in the notes of today's podcast. So you can contact and connect with Amy because I'm sure she would love to hear from you. But please mention when you message her that you heard about her on this podcast. That is Elevate Your Life, a transformational podcast. Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Farhan, for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and just connect with you in any way. Yes, and the pleasure is all mine. And we've had the opportunity to share a conversation on email as well, as well as on my Instagram page. We did a live one day. And I remember at the end of that conversation, I said that I hope we can continue and have another conversation. And so I'm excited to have you here today on my podcast so that I could help spread the word of your work because I am a huge follower and a fan. As I've said, I've become a follower of your work and have been regularly practicing your breathing techniques that you developed. And by the way, you can follow Amy live on her Facebook, Facebook, sorry, or Instagram page where she takes you through the breath work. And there's also videos of each live in case you missed an episode. And there's lots of great information there, including videos called the weekend wellness hour, where Amy has on some amazing guests that she interviews. Amy, I really appreciate all the information you regularly share. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I think in this time, it's great to share knowledge with each other. And often we don't know who to turn to for resources. So if I can help kind of put together a resource list of various medical and health and fitness and wellness professionals, I am glad to do it to serve you know, the world, basically. 
and that you are. And when I first heard you speak, as I said, on the mindfulness and grief podcast, I knew I needed to connect with you. I emailed you. I shared my story with you. And I felt we had quite a few things in common in that we both come from physiotherapy or physical therapy backgrounds, but we also share our personal journey as caregivers. And Mm -hmm. I was wondering if maybe you could start off the conversation today by sharing your caregiving journey, as well as your subsequent grief journey and how all of that led to what you are now calling the Pabar Method. Sure. So I grew up in a very tumultuous childhood. There are quite a few people out there who do experience that. And I grew up with my mother and one of my brothers. My dad was, wasn't was really in the picture. It was mostly because they fought so much and it was just, it was very traumatic. And so when I got into my teenage years, I, I tutored my mother to help her go to college And when I got done with that and I decided to go study abroad, um, I was in college at that point as in my starting my third year in college, I decided to go study in France and that infuriated my mother. She was really upset that she lost control over me. And I specifically planned it out to be able to escape from her control. And so when I got back, she got extremely angry at me. She kicked me out of the house. She didn't want to have anything to do with me. And we had a very tumultuous relationship after that. We would go months without speaking. And eventually it turned into nine years without speaking. I just, I couldn't handle being told that I wasn't supposed to be alive, that I had to pay her back for being born as the cause of all of her health problems. And so it was quite traumatic to hear. And so at that point I decided not to talk to her until I got notification that she was passing away from cancer. And when we reunited, I apologized immediately. That was the first thing out of my mouth was I'm so sorry. And she apologized as well. And within a week after that, she was put on hospice care and she came to live with me under hospice care. That was, as you can imagine, going from very independent woman and not having contact with someone who had verbally and mentally abused you to now taking care of her, it was quite a shock to my system, shock to my body, shock to my lifestyle. And so I worked during the day and basically a couple times throughout the day, hospice came in with various treatments, various people who who helped me out. And then at night, as soon as I got done with work, I went home and I took care of her. And it was hard because she was non-ambulatory anymore. And she still had her mind about her. She still had her personality to treat me somewhat like a slave, um, ordering me around. She would drop things on purpose to make me come over and pick it up. She would tell me to turn the radio up, then turn it down. And it was quite a trauma to my existence. And it brought back a lot of memories of why I didn't talk to her for nine years. And every Thursday we had a fight. I couldn't handle it anymore. We had a fight. And then eventually we made back up because I realized, you know what, her time is limited. I need to be the bigger person here. And by the time she got worse and we had to put her in a more, um, more care level care facility, we, we had made peace. I had stood up for myself several times and asked her to please start using some manners. And she did occasionally, but we did have peace. And by the time that her cancer worsened, um, she, she became more appreciative and I, my time spent with her was nicer. And a week before my birthday that year, she finally, you know, she started turning downhill and I asked her if she was going to be there for my birthday. And she said, yes. And about five days, four or five days before my birthday, she finally started losing consciousness and she had something called terminal restlessness where you start to, you start to call out and you start to see things, you experience things that can't really be explained by those of us who are living. It's something that happens occasionally with those who are passing away. And um, I knew that she was about to go and she held on until two minutes into my birthday. 
she um, she had been non-responsive, non-communicative for about three or four days. And then I sat with her um, just, just as she was passing away. And she finally, she opened her eyes, squeezed my hand, smiled, tried to speak. And I told her, I said, you know, I love you. You're all, both of your sons love you. We all forgive you. We all hope for love and peace as you pass away from this world. And um, she, she smiled. She opened her eyes. She smiled. She let me know she was okay. And she passed away and she, she did it. She celebrated my birthday with me. And it was the same day that her mother was born. So it was kind of a special day for our family. And she left us and it was hard. It was really hard. And my body had been in fight or flight mode for gosh, months. She had, it had been seven months of this journey which I know in the grand scheme of things isn't long compared to some people who spend years and years taking care of their parents. But my body did go into severe fight or flight mode and actually went kind of almost into a, a drop from that point. And I had severe illnesses and different things that were happening. And my dad almost died two weeks later and changed jobs. And there was a lot of transition in my life at that point. So I went into this over the threshold fight or flight mode where everything began to shut down and, and stress, it impacted every bit of my being, thyroid, everything, gut, you name it. And at the same time, I was starting this process of learning how to calm down the nervous system. And that's what helped me through. And that's what I like to share with people because it can do wonders to help you get out of that crisis mode. Yeah. Did, did your mom suffer from any mental illness? Was that part of her medical history? Yeah. So she, she was never diagnosed with anything until she was in hospice care. So I didn't know growing up that she was mentally ill other than I realized there's something wrong with her. One day she was nice. Next day she was a terror. And so hospice diagnosed her at least bipolar highly likely borderline personality disorder. Now they gave her medicine for bipolar disorder because they said that that was minimum that they could do that they wanted to do even. Um, and it steadied her mood out. And she, I remember her even saying to me, I hate this medication. And I said, why? And she said, I feel so steady. I don't feel the highs and lows of life anymore. So there was, she definitely had some chemical imbalances and for her to think that these highs and lows were a great thing and to feel calm was horrible to her. You, you knew that something was going on. Um, first of all, I'm so sorry you went through all of that. It must've been a very difficult time period. Um, you did mention that you, you felt you were in the fight or flight mode during that seven month period during her illness. Um, but in hindsight, looking back, do you think that a lot of that was experienced in your childhood growing up, being around in that environment? And, you know, unfortunately with the impact of someone with mental illness and the way that you were treated, um, do you think that that fight or flight was within you for a very long period of time for you to have, you know, the reaction that you did and the way your body broke down and, and compounded with your dad's illness on top of that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, one of my first memories of, of my life is hiding under a table with my parents screaming at each other. And that's one of my earliest childhood memories that and chasing a rabbit, but pretty much growing up with her, I never knew what each day would bring. I was always on guard and it also drove me to act as perfect as I possibly could in every single way, which hopefully most people know by now that is not healthy. There is nothing healthy about perfectionism, nothing healthy about being afraid to make mistakes. And it's something that I carried with me. And yes, it gave me the drive for school. It gave me the drive to learn things, but it wasn't a healthy drive to those types of behaviors. So I really understand the fight or flight mode. And I remember being a kid thinking, I never want to become an adult because all they, 
do is be stressed out. And all, my model was her. I never saw her happy and just jovial and laughing. I mean, occasionally here or there, but it wasn't something that was sustained. So, yeah. Yeah. And when I heard you speak on the mindfulness and grief podcast, and it was the first realization I think that I had that I too had been in fight or flight for so long myself, having been a caregiver, not just for my mother, but also my father prior to that. And we're, we're talking about over 10 years worth of caregiving. And as you know, um, when you're a caregiver, you're always on alert. You always have to be turned on. You have to be ready for the unexpected. And some of my memories of these moments of having um, to be in fight or flight mode would often happen in the middle of the night. And in particular with my dad, um, during his cancer treatment, he would have episodes of delirium. And so there was one night where I was startled and woken up. And when I came into the hall, he was holding on to the walls thinking we were being attacked. Oh. And on another um, episode of his delirium, uh, he was holding on to the wall. And when I came out, my mom was on the floor and somehow he had shoved her to the ground while she was trying to help him get back to bed. Mm. And so I didn't know who to help first, get my mom off the floor or to get my dad, you know, to calm down and, and go back to bed. And my mom said to me, I'm fine. You get your dad settled and then come back for me. Mm -hmm. And um, many times he would fall out of bed and often in the middle of the night. And one time he, he found himself trapped on the stairs and he was seated and he couldn't get up. And I had to call the paramedics to come and help. Um, and then with my mother, she had a history of falls. And so we gave her a motion detection pendant to wear that would, if, it, in, in, if she had a, a fall, uh, it would set off an alarm, which would alert paramedics. And the alarm would go off in the house to notify all of us that there was a situation. And so many times I would jump out of bed startled, run into my mom's bedroom, and sometimes there were false alarms. And unfortunately, other times I would find her on the floor and I would have to carry her and pick, pick her up and go back to bed. And so long story short, um, I've been in fight or flight for so long. And even since both of them have transitioned, um, learning to go back to sleep without worrying that something's going to happen in the middle of the night has been something of um, uh, a newness to to learn and your power method of breathing has been something that I've been practicing even at night so that I can, you know, calm my nervous system down and, and go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if maybe we could talk about the power method now and sure. you could describe what it is and, and why it is that it's so beneficial and how it helped you um, during your period when, when you were, coping with, you know, the illnesses that happened after your, after your mom passed away. Absolutely. So the approach is basically a nervous system approach. If we look at the common denominator for people in pain, stress, anxiety, people getting ready for orthopedic surgeries, people with sleep issues, it's all that nervous system, that fight or flight nervous system we get ramped up to the point that we either numb ourselves, we either can't feel something, our muscles don't work the way that they're intended to work. So that's the common denominator for all of it. And so if we can approach all of those issues by looking at what is the fight or flight nervous system doing, that's truly the method that, that we're doing with the PABR method. So PABR stands for pain, awareness, breathing, relief. We're looking at getting you from pain to relief using awareness training, breathing training as a, a process to shift you. And so the breathing part of it comes in because breathing and breath work we know is a method to tap into the fight or flight nervous system to calm it down. Now the key is with breath work, is if your body is in a position of fight or flight mode, your breathing typically responds and reflects that. 
So we have to be careful. There's a lot of breath work out there that changes like the rhythm of your breathing, whether it's box breathing, buchiko, there's different types out there. But if your rib cage is set in fight or flight mode, your breathing is going to continue to exacerbate the fight or flight response. That's something that we have to be aware of. And part of the power method is looking at your body position, pairing that with changing your breathing mechanism. So the magic of the two is what calms your nervous system down and helps you out because your rib cage position, if your ribs are elevated in front, that means your back muscles in the, in the back along your spine are going to contract to help hold those ribs up in front. If we think of that Superman posture, when you do that, that's going to stimulate that fight or flight nervous system that lies along your spine. So we want to avoid that, but often we're taught Superman posture because it looks good because it makes you feel powerful. But as soon as you do that, you can feel yourself feel more awake. That's that you're kicking your nut high alert system. The problem with that is when you lift up the front of your ribs, you're also lifting up the side of your diaphragm, which makes it less effective. And so you're less likely to stimulate the vagus nerve to calm you down. So we want to shift you into dropping those ribs down in front. So you're back in neutral, both for your body position and for your use of your diaphragm. And so when you pair that together, all of a sudden you can start to relax more and you can feel releases in your body, whether it's release of your muscles and release your joints. So your joints go back into position. So you stop having pain, or you can feel a release of the pressure in your chest, which can help with that sense of you can't get air in, which affects anxiety, which affects stress, which affects panic. So also when you learn to shift your breathing and you change yourself to calm yourself down during the daytime hours, it's easier for your body to recognize what it feels like to rest at night when you close your eyeballs. And so when we're in a state of grief, are we still in fight or flight? Would you say? For the most part, most of us are. There are times where a person become, can become severely depressed, but let's say you're still in the grief stages where it's something that's happened recently and you're going through this process, you're feeling sadness. You can, fe- you can be in fight or flight mode during that time period because you'll notice that if you can't focus, you can't think, you're not creative, you can't imagine or visualize then your body's in like basically a freeze mode where you can't do those executive and creative functions because all you can do is just get through the next moment. You may use eating to feel, you may use some kind of extreme sport to feel, you may not even want to feel, and those are all different forms of grief. Over time, your body may not be able to handle any more of that trauma. And you might really go into this numb state, or you could go into a severe depression where everything just slows down. And that sometimes is kind of like from an adrenal fatigue or your body is just crashing from sympathetic mode into just, it's not really parasympathetic relaxation, but it kind of almost feels like it where you don't even want to get up. You don't want to move. It's just and exhaustion so- and depression. And- exactly. And sometimes you might actually need to stimulate your fight or flight nervous system just to help spark you out of it and show you another existence. Because the longer you spend in this severe dis- depression, your brain chemistry changes and that becomes your new existence. So you almost at that point need to shock yourself into fight or flight mode to, to realize another existence. And something like maybe exercise can help with that, right? Definitely. Absolutely. Because the exercise will kick in a little bit of that fight or flight response, get you moving and which changes your brain chemistry. Obviously it helps get rid of toxins. There's so many benefits from exercise. Yeah. When I, when I think of grief and and going back to the different stages of grief, um, initially there could be shock and, Mm -hmm. um, and denial and, and even trauma. Um, and so I can see how the power method would be very effective in helping you to do that. And then if you are in a regular practice of it can prevent some of the, um, or lessen some of the symptoms that are associated with grief. Eventually you, 
you have to go through it um, regardless of where you're at. Um, no one's exempt from grief, yes. but uh, at least this is giving people a tool in which they can support their physiology um, and try to help them function in some way. Um, is grief held in our body or in certain body parts? It really is. Now everyone can be different, but when I work with people, I've worked with people with the worst cases of trauma and abuse you'll ever hear. I mean, the worst imaginable. And the, some of the common areas that I see it specifically is the breastbone that becomes very rigid. It's, it can be very protruded out. Um, it doesn't have the mobility that it should. And specifically right at the base of your breastbone by your xiphoid process where your lower ribs meet together, that's a huge area where people store trauma, huge. And if you think about it, if someone came running up to you and they scared you, you tighten up right there. That's where you hold it. Now imagine that being your existence all the time. When that's your existence and you store that emotion and trauma in there, it affects your physical body. It affects how your nervous system works. It affects your ability to function and to, to do things in your daily life. So that's a huge area. A couple other areas are the armpit areas and then the front of the hips, kind of like that groin area. Those areas I see where people guard and guard and guard and you don't even know how you guard because it's not registering in your brain because it's so innate in you now. And then when we're working on freeing it up, Sometimes the releases that people have can be both inspiring as well as scary, as well as um, rewarding. So it's, it's a process to unwind all of these things that happen. And specific to the nervous system though, how does grief impact our nervous system? So with the, when you're going through something in terms of an emotional trauma, your body is going to have a physiological effect. Okay, so the muscles begin to tighten up because your nervous system has been triggered that you need to be in a protective or high alert state. So your muscles start to contract without your awareness often. And your nervous system, of course, you have cortisol or adrenaline that starts to flow through you. So your nervous system starts to learn, okay, this is your new existence. If you don't calm that down or get rid of that or go through it or process it, your nervous system's going to habituate to that and it's going to stay that way. So even when the trauma, the acute trauma has passed, you are still stuck. So your body is still operating on trauma mode, on high alert mode. And your nervous system is now reset for existing that way. And so many of us who are listening right now may have not necessarily lost a loved one or experiencing a direct impact of grief, but we're all being impacted by grief in some way at this time, whether it's the life we once knew or having to readjust our lives, each one of us is experiencing some form of grief. And so there's something here for everyone in what you're sharing with us and that with everyone's nervous system on alert right now, um, having this, the impact of the pandemic and knowing that our lives could change just instantly and not feeling secure about the way the world can be sometimes. Mm -hmm. Many of us are sitting on high alert. Um, what do you recommend as far as um, helping to sort of calm our, ourselves down? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so obviously I'm going to say a little bit, uh, start practicing some of the breathing techniques I teach. Now, the stuff I put on social media, that's just the very beginning. It's, it can it help people who maybe are not so chronic and people who are really in touch with their bodies. Um, for quite a few people, they need the one-on-one -on -one and it takes weeks to shift the body, if not months but it, everyone's at a different stage. So there's plenty of resources out there, but they would definitely start looking at how much do you hold your breath during the day? How do you sit? Do you sit in a relaxed manner or do you sit at the edge of your seat tensed up? 
your, the position of your body determines a lot about you. So if you put it in the position of fight or flight mode, everything else that comes into your world is going to perceive, be perceived at a greater danger. Check in with yourself as well. See, if you suck up your gut and suck your gut up and in, many times people suck up and in and it puts them in high alert. So if you can let your belly out, let your ribs drop down, let it all relax. Those are some of the things that I would start doing check-ins with yourself throughout the day and you'll catch yourself holding your breath. You'll catch yourself sucking your gut up and in. You'll catch yourself at the edge of your chair ramped up. Then ask yourself, do you really want to be there in this fight or flight mode or do you want to change so that you're in parasympathetic relaxation so that when you need to go in fight or flight mode, that resource is available to you? What comes to mind is watching and learning how babies breathe mm -hmm. because they're in that relaxed state. Um, there's no sucking in their belly. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, lying on their stomach or on their backs and they're very relaxed. Um, do you feel like, you know, we've sort of lost the art of breath and breathing? I think so. And I think it has to do with we're taught from very young sit up straight, suck up your gut, pull your shoulders back. And because we're trying to create this image of Superman in our little kids, we're trying to force them to be one extreme. Instead of us being more in neutral where a rib cage is like a cylinder instead of hinged back, we start to shift people into high alert state. We're not designed to be that way. If you think about a lot of big animals, cats, dogs, lions, tigers, bears, they all sleep curled up. Sometimes they lay sprawled out, but it's still everything gets curled up. And then when they want to, or when they need to, they get up and run, chase something. They stretch, they arch their back, they wake themselves up, and then they perform. They're not on high alert all day long. They understand the beauty of rest and recovery. So that way they can perform at a high level when they need to. So how can the PABAR method help us with grief and give us some grief relief? Mm -hmm. Well, so if you start to learn how to calm yourself down. So what I do with people is we start going through a process of changing your body position and changing the way you breathe so that you can feel a general relaxation. Okay. And once you feel that general relaxation throughout your body, you practice that, then we meet again, then we start to progress you. And what we're doing is we're unlocking parts of your body where the grief is held. We're unlocking the pressure in the chest that you can't get rid of. We have to give you the skills on how to unlock that again. So there may be different activities you can do in your arms and legs to help you sense and feel that pressure let go. So it's not just sit and breathe. That's only, we spend like a couple minutes on that and then off we go on to other stuff because we have to teach you how to move your legs differently, how to use your arms differently, how to exist differently in all your daily activities so that you don't get caught up in the grief process where everything gets stuck. And a lot of, a lot of times if someone's going through some severe grief, they are getting additional counseling through their psychologist, counselor, psychiatrist to help with mental and emotional strategies while we work through opening up the body again. That sounds great. So would you mind taking us through a demo today? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. We can do this sitting down. We'll just spend a couple minutes here. Okay. So I just want everyone who's listening right now, please don't do this while you're operating a vehicle. If you are, um, you can listen, but maybe participate when it's safe to do so. And um, just let Amy guide you through the entire process and pay particular attention to the positioning of the rib cage and she'll take you through all of that. Okay, so we're going to sit back in the chair. If you have a chair, sit all the way back in your chair. Let your low back relax into the chair back. Get rid of the lumbar support if you can. If you absolutely need it, go ahead and have it, but try to get rid of it if you can. Let your tailbone curl underneath you, feet flat on the ground. And now look, are your knees at the height of your hips 
or are they lower than the top of your hips? If they're lower, put some books under your feet to get them at least to the height of your top of your hips, if not higher. You can also try lowering your chair, whichever works. You may need to do both. And then we're gonna take one hand and put it on your chest, one hand on your belly. Okay. And in this position, we're gonna do a four step breathing process. We're gonna breathe in through the nose, pause a second, blow out through the mouth, and then pause and hold the breath for three seconds. Okay. So as we go through this, it's gonna seem easy at first and then it'll get a little bit more complicated. Okay. So if you can close your eyes, obviously those who are driving don't do this. So close your eyes and we're gonna just listen to my voice and follow the instructions. So we're gonna gently breathe in. Breathe in your nose, pause, and blow out through your mouth. Hear the air whooshing out of your mouth. Hold, hold, now breathe in. Gently breathe in your nose without effort. Pause and blow out. Blow out through your mouth, hear the air come out. Hold and breathe in, gently breathe in. Feel the air go in passively and blow out. Feel your chest melt in away from your hand. Feel your belly spill out. Hold, hold and breathe in, gently breathe in. Feel the air go in passively and blow out. Chest mounts in, let that low back go, belly opens. Hold, hold and breathe in, gently breathe in. Feel the air go in without effort. Pause and blow out, chest mounts in, armpits relax, belly opens. Hold, hold and breathe in, gently breathe in. Feel the air go in passively and blow out, armpits relax. Let that low back go, belly opens. Hold, hold and breathe in, gently breathe in. Feel the air go in passively and blow out, chest mounts in, Low back lets go, belly softens. Hold, hold, and take a break. So that's just a little snippet to get people started. It, there's a lot more involved than that, but at least we'll get you the idea of how you want to start to shift your breathing. That was great. And I know you mentioned that that would be just the beginning of a session with you. Um, for people who are listening right now, um, what would you recommend in terms of how to incorporate this breath work into, you know, a busy schedule, hectic life, or how often and how long, um, you know, a typical breath work session should last to receive people, the benefits? Mm -hmm. sure. I usually tell people for about five minutes, when you first wake up, do a little practice before lunch, a little bit of practice, because it helps with digestion again, before dinner, and then a few minutes before bed. If you can break it up just a little bit here and there, it starts to get your nervous system to realize, wait a second, I don't need to be ramped up all the time. I can actually take a break. And you start to crave being calm. You start to crave not being on high alert. And so your nervous system starts to change more and more. But even so, I still encourage people to practice a little bit throughout the day, even if you have shifted more into the calm side of the scale. What I love about this is that it all starts with the breath and how really we're trying to get people to come to their natural state of being because the parasympathetic response is our natural state. It's not the fight or flight though. We need it. You know, it's, it's there for our safety in times of emergency. And when we need to be in high alert and we need to be on adrenaline, but we're not meant to be that way all the time. But um, that all healing also starts with breath and everything begins with breath. And I don't, I don't see how you could be on a healing journey of any sort and not be addressing the breath piece. 
Um, it's really about working from the nervous system and the inside out. Whereas oftentimes, you know, as practitioners and physical therapists, we start with symptoms and work on the outside and start looking at what's in front of us and assessing range of motion and strength. But the nervous system is a key component to all of this. So I'm, I'm so grateful that you're getting this message out there, that you're sharing it with the world. Um, I love what you do. I will continue to follow you on Facebook and Instagram. And um, for those of you who are, you know, trying this breath work right now with us, you've only gotten a sample of what Amy has to offer. Please do look her up and contact her if you have any questions. If you have a particular issue that maybe you've been working with a, a particular practitioner or many and you haven't gotten anywhere, Perhaps Amy has um, some valuable insight and information to help you on your healing journey, um, whether it's grief or orthopedics, um, pre-op, post-op, orthopedic stresses and injuries, or just maybe you have a type A personality and you want to learn a new way of living and come back to your natural state of being. So thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for joining me today and for sharing your your light and being a powerful source of light in this world today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on Farhan. Really appreciate it. I'm Farhan Dalla. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode of Elevate Your Life, a transformational podcast. I hope today's conversation has elevated you in some way and inspired you to connect, move and meditate. I'd really appreciate your support by following and rating this podcast. Come back soon and join me for another transformative conversation.